So last Sunday night, family meeting. That was awesome, wasn't it? Wasn't that awesome? I thought it was awesome. Someone mentioned to me after the meeting that uh, they thought that was a pivotal event, a pivotal meeting for the life of this church. And I think so too. I'm excited about uh, what, what we're going to do going forward. Uh, for those of you who weren't here, uh, it's, it was a time where we spent um, an hour-ish, I think, in addition to some other things, we spent about an hour where people were sharing ideas and thoughts on how we can fill the city of Colorado Springs with the gospel, to make disciples throughout our entire community. That's what we want to do. That's our heart. That's why we launched the East Campus, and now it's time to take the next step and really think through how do all of us at both campuses reach out to the community and bring people to know Jesus Christ. And as, as you know, if you've been here, we've done three, three weeks in a series that I called How to Lead Someone to Christ. And after last Sunday night's uh, meeting, I decided we need to, need to do one more. So today we're going to uh, finish up this series with, uh, with this final message today. Uh, if, you're, if you want to uh, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to look at that uh, in a few moments. Uh, but before we get there... I'm going to pray, and then we're going to uh, make some introductory remarks. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, we just sang, there is none but Jesus. He is our everything. He is the purpose of our lives. He's the purpose for the existence of everything that's been created. He's the story of the Bible. He's the heir of the world. He's our Savior and our King. Everything is about Jesus, and we want nothing apart from him. Father, we know that's true, and we proclaim that together, but there are many, many people near us that do not and cannot sing that song. There's a lot of things that they put higher than Jesus. Would you use us? to call them to repentance and faith, to bow the knee to King Jesus and to find a hope and salvation in Jesus and be able to sing with us someday, none but Jesus. Father, would you use this message today in your word and would your spirit show up and work on all of our hearts and minds and give us courage and boldness and faithfulness to preach the gospel to those who do not know. And I ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. So I'm going to give you the, uh, the whole message right here at the beginning, just, just right here. This is it. This is it. There is one key that we have to remember as we seek to preach the gospel, just one, one key, and this is the heart of everything, this right here. We have the power to save people. We have it already. There is nothing else that we need. We have the power to save people. If you're a Christian, you have the power. I'm going to show you from Romans chapter 1. Let's put that up. Romans 1, 16 says, this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church in, in Rome, and he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ. Why? For it, the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel, the message of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the power of God for salvation. If you know the gospel, if you have the gospel, so to speak, you have the power to save. It's in, it's in the message. It's in the story it's what God has decided to use. The gospel is the means God has decided to use to bring people from darkness to light. And if you know the gospel, you have it. We have to remember this. This will give us motivation. This will give us focus. And this will give us courage. Which we need those three things if we're going to talk to people about Jesus. We need motivation. We need focus. We need courage. Think about this. Think about, and I, I've used this illustration before, but let me flesh it out a little bit more. Think about if you had a pill that could cure cancer. 
if you had a pill, if you had this, would you be motivated to find people that have cancer? You would, right? You'd be going up and down your streets. You'd be going up and down the halls of your workplace, at your school, anywhere looking for people with cancer because you have the cure. You have what they need. You'd be motivated to find them. You'd want to because you can help them. You would have focus if you started talking to them about cancer and they wanted to go down different paths and talk about something else and if they were skeptical about how long they're going to live or if there's really any cure or whatever, no matter what direction they tried to take you in the conversation, you would bring them right back to this. But if you'll just take the pill, you can be healed and you wouldn't get caught in all kinds of side conversations and distractions. Yeah, 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 but, but yeah, I've, got the, I've got the cure. And you'd have courage. If you knew for certain this pill could cure cancer, you'd have all kinds of courage to say to people, yes, I know, I know it's hard, but here, test me on this. Try me. Take it and see if it doesn't cure you. Well, we have the power to save. Now, the metaphor breaks down. I get that. But, but go with me that far. Go with me that far. We have the gospel. If we get this in our minds that it is the gospel that saves, think about the motivation. I have the power. I have the gospel which will save people. That will motivate me to get to know people that I work with. Well, the people that I work with are all Christians. But you know what I mean. The people that you work with are not all Christians. At least I think they're all Christians. You guys are dead this morning again. Uh, it will help motivate you to think, okay, I want to get to know people. I want to get to find out who it is that needs this salvation because I have something that will help them. It'll help focus the conversation and not get distracted by all the different places that conversations can go. When you start talking to somebody, yeah, 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 we can talk about that and that's important and yeah, sure, but let's get back to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Let's bring it back. You will try, like a giant funnel, you will try to bring everything down to this one point to talk to people about Jesus if you're absolutely convinced that message can save them. And it will give you courage when you come to an unbeliever and you know they're lost and you can help them be reconciled to God if they believe the gospel. It will it'll help you take the, the steps to say, I want to talk to you about your state before God and I want to share hope with you. Knowing this, knowing that the power of God for salvation is the gospel will bring motivation, focus, and courage. Think about the reasons why we struggle sometimes to, to share the gospel, to, to engage in this uh, with people. Sometimes it's because we just don't have very many unbelieving friends. That's true for me. It was mentioned several times Sunday night. Many of us just don't rub elbows with unbelievers very much. But if you know you have the gospel, if you know you have what will save them, maybe that will motivate you to, to be outside more in your neighborhood. And when you see somebody else outside, go talk to them. Try to start a, start a conversation with them. People that you work with, okay, the gospel can save them. This will help help you reach out. Uh, someone said to me recently, the best way to meet people they found is buy a dog. So my kid's been trying to use that. It's not working. But get a dog. Chris and I go running several days a week and every potty out on the trail with a dog she wants to stop and talk to. It works. I'm like, we got to run. She's like, no, there's a cute puppy. Let's talk. So if you're the one carrying on the cute puppy, people will stop and talk to you. Who knows what you might be able to do with that. At the gym, whatever you're doing, you have the gospel with you. Use it. Be motivated to reach out to them. Another thing that uh, we often, uh, uh, another reason we're often, uh, we don't preach the gospel is we're just afraid. We might as well just be real here and admit it. We're sometimes afraid to talk to people about Jesus, right? Anybody? Anybody? Anybody sometimes, you know the time is right, yeah, it's right here, I know this is, I, I need to say something, and you talk yourself out of it, and the heart of that really is fear. Pray for boldness, Paul did, I love that at the end of Ephesians 6, I love that, 
Paul, super apostle, has the big A on his chest, you know. He said, pray for me that I would be bold. He needed boldness from the Spirit of God to actually go into the next city and preach the gospel. We're, we're just like Paul when we're afraid. But we're not just like Paul if we let that fear overcome us. Pray for boldness, pray for the strength to overcome, but take heart that you have the power to save in the gospel. It's not you that has to save them. The gospel will do the work. God will do the work. Speak the truth and see what God does with that. You can overcome fears. Another thing that we... Uh, that keeps us from preaching the gospel is we don't feel equipped. This came out in several things that were said Sunday night as well. We just don't feel equipped because we know we're going to get asked questions if we bring it up. We know there are some that are uh, absolutely convinced uh, that science is the means of all truth. And it, of course, we all know this. Everybody that we rub shoulders with uh, that are unbelievers pretty much are committed to the theory of evolution. We know that. And the fact that it's just a theory and that there's zero evidence of macroevolution doesn't deter anybody. It's pretty much assumed to be a fact. And we know at some point they're probably going to ask us questions. Well, how do you explain this? How do you explain that? What do you, what do, you do with this? And, and we kind of pull back and say, ah, I don't know if I have the answers to that. And we forget. We can just turn it back on them and say, how about those fossil records? How about those transitional species? Let's, let's see those records. But if you haven't studied this stuff... Uh, you, you feel like, I don't know if I'm going to have all the right answers to respond to those things. And I get that. Uh, or there's the logical questions that may come up. I've been asked these a hundred times. You probably have too. So you're saying God made everything, right? Right. Well, who made God? Have you ever been asked that question? If you have kids, you've been asked that question. Who made God? Nobody made God. Well, how do you know? Well, and, and there's a whole rational argument for this. If there was ever a time when there was nothing, what would there be now? You know this, right? If there was ever a time when there was nothing, what would there be now? I don't care what Winnie the Pooh says. If there was ever a time when there was nothing, there would be nothing now. So there has to be something that exists forever. That's God but obviously you're not all prepared to engage in that conversation. So you might think, oh, I don't want to bring this up in case somebody asks me a hard question I don't know the answer to. Yep, that happens. Probably the ones that we're most afraid of are the theological questions. Things like this. If there's a God and he's good, right, then there's a whole host of things that come after that. If there's a God and he's good, then... Why is there evil? Why does this happen? Why does he allow that to happen? And they fill in whatever tragedy, whatever travesty, whatever horrible thing they can think of, and, and you feel stuck. You feel stuck because that's a long conversation. And we sort of shift in the mode where we feel like we have to defend God. And, and sometimes, even as Christians, frankly, we have a hard time answering that question to our own satisfaction. I mean, we can learn all the right answers, but there's a place in which we have to say, this still is hard. This is still hard to acknowledge that there's a lot of awful things going on in the world, and yet God is letting it happen, right? Or if God is loving, if God is really loving as you say, what comes after that? Anybody? Anybody? How can a loving God send people to hell? I've been asked that question several times. God is loving, right? Yeah, he's loving. How can a loving God send somebody to hell? And we kind of get stuck. Like, well, but they're a sinner. Yeah, yeah, but if he's loving, he can just forgive that sin. And sometimes we, we pull back. These are all uh, important questions. They're all questions that have answers. Another logical question sometimes uh, people raise is, could God make a rock so big that he can't move it? Again, if you've had kids, you've been asked that question. The answer is no, he can't. Well, I thought God can do anything. Yeah, 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 you don't understand the question. There are answers to all these questions, and it's worth our time to engage uh, with those answers. There's a lot of great resources. 
And, you know, we live here near Manitou where Summit Ministries is, and they have a lot of great resources, and sometimes we get to take advantage of that down here. There are so many books, so many great podcasts and, and, uh, and videos out there on all of the, the, this stuff. We can find good answers for these things, and we should. And I commend you all to pursue the study of apologetics and defending the faith because the truth deserves to be defended. And God deserves to be held up. His truth deserves to be held up. However, when we're engaging an unbeliever, their problem is not an intellectual one. We're never going to have all the right answers that will persuade them to put their faith in Jesus. Because the scripture tells us their problem is not up here. Their problem is not that they just don't know anything about God or the truth about God. In fact, the Bible says just the opposite. Earlier in in chapter uh, 1 of Romans, uh, the scripture says that all men everywhere know that God exists. Everybody knows. I told you this before. People who say that they're atheists are not being honest with you. There's no such thing as a true atheist. Everybody knows that God exists. The problem is people don't like him. And if they acknowledge that God exists, then they have to thank him and honor him and worship him and obey him. And people don't want to do that. The Bible describes that as a heart problem. It's a problem of the will, of the desire, not of the intellect. So you can come up with answers to all of these questions. I've had this, this uh, encounter a few times where I have silenced my opposition. I was one step ahead of them because I've heard all these questions over and over again. I knew exactly where they're going, and, and they finally had to say, okay, I don't have any more questions. You've answered all my questions. All right, you ready to put your faith in Jesus? Nope. Why not? Because I'm just not convinced. Why well, answered all your questions, and you stopped debating me? Nope because it's a heart issue. Their heart was hardened. This is the state of the people we're talking to. Their hearts are hardened. They don't want to believe the truth. We saw last week, who's the one that changes hearts? Remember, this is the promise in Ezekiel 36 about what happened when Jesus came. Who changes the hearts? The, the Spirit of God does. It says, I will take out your hard heart and I will replace it with a soft heart. I will take out your spirit that is against me and I will replace it with my spirit so that you will now want to please me and obey me. That's the spirit's work. How does he do that? He does it through the preaching of the gospel. That's what God uses to take a hard heart and make it soft, the preaching of the gospel. You have the gospel. You have the means the Spirit of of God uses to change people's hearts. Doesn't have to be apologetics. You don't have to major in philosophy. You don't have to read all those books. Preach the gospel. Let everything funnel down to the heart of the gospel, which is Jesus. Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 14 through chapter 2, 2, and then make a comment on it. Obviously, I'm not here to expound this text as if we were going through 1 Corinthians, but I just want to pull out some things for our conversation here today. So listen as I read, starting in verse 14 of chapter 1. Paul, again, says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus, Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved It is the power of God. For it is written, this is God speaking in the Old Covenant, Old Testament, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Then Paul continues, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? 
For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Let me read that again. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message about Jesus preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews, a stumbling block. To Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren. And here he gets a little personal and humbling. Consider your calling, brethren, that not many of you were wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, quote, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord, end quote. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul, if you don't know this, Paul was a giant of an intellectual man. This man was extremely, extremely intelligent. I mean, he'd be the kind of guy in our day that would have four PhDs, speak many, many languages. He's read everything that's been written. You know, he just knew stuff. He was such a giant mind. And notice what he says to these Corinthians here. I didn't come with all that wisdom, all that knowledge, and all that information for you. I preached Christ, and Christ crucified him. That was the heart of my message. So in uh, verses 14 through 16, he says, I didn't come to baptize you. In fact, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you. And then he says, well, I did baptize a few of you. But anyway, the broader point is I didn't baptize very many of you. Why? He says, because I don't want you to think that your salvation and your hope is in me. It's not about celebrity. It's not about superstars. It's not about somebody that just knows all kinds of things. That's not what it's about. Paul says, I don't want you to to hinge your hopes on me or any other celebrity pastor or celebrity preacher or some other intellect, some scientist, some Christian scientist, not Christian scientist, but some scientist who's a Christian. Uh, I, I don't want you to pin your hopes on anybody except Jesus. So I'm glad that I didn't baptize most of you who were baptized there in the Corinthian church. Verse 17, you don't need powerful arguments or rhetoric. See what it says? For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech. You don't have to have the answers to everybody's questions. You don't have to know the answer to, can God make a rock so big that he can't move it? I mean, that's an easy one. You should know that. But you don't have to know that one. Do you know the gospel? Can you preach Christ and him crucified? Because that's what's going to save them, not your ability to respond to all their cynical questions. He said, I didn't come with that. I didn't come with a well-prepared message. I didn't come with a well-prepared sermon. I didn't come with my careful outline of how to lead you down a path. Now, now don't get me wrong. Some of those tools can be helpful. If, if you need to know passages and need to know kind of how to focus on Christ, there's nothing wrong with having a, a, an evangelism technique, so to speak. But Paul says, I didn't come with a really slick presentation. Flashy over, over not over heads, what are they called? Uh, slides. I didn't come with a 3D, you know, uh, presentation with lights, big light show and smoke show and all that. I just came with the simple words of Jesus and the message of Jesus. Because I want your hope to be pinned on Christ, not on my presentation. That's good. I like that because 
I'm not very good with lasers and smoke show. Verse 18, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Same thing he told the Romans, it is the power of God. The word of Christ, the message of Christ, the gospel is what will save people. And then verses 19 through 31, that long passage there where he, he says, the world calls the message of the cross foolishness. It's folly. The gospel is folly. It doesn't make any sense. And it's weak. A, a crucified Messiah, a crucified Savior, that seems like weakness. But God said, I'm going to use what the world calls foolishness and weakness, and I'm going to use that message to bring people to salvation so that they don't boast in any preacher, they don't boast in anything else, they boast in me alone. If you're going to boast, you boast in God. So as those who, who are preaching the gospel, our goal is to take them to the cross, preach Christ and him crucified, so that their only boast will be in God who saves, not in you and me who preach. It's not about us. And he reminds them, there are many in that congregation, he says, you weren't wise, you weren't strong, you weren't mighty people. And he could look around this congregation and say the same thing, right? Starting with your pastor. Not wise, not mighty, not noble, but God chooses the foolish things of the world. That's me and you. We were fools. And God saved us so we would boast in him, not in ourselves. And then the heart of it is chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. When I came, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Again, I think when we articulate the gospel, we need to be able to put two sentences together. Don't babble on like a fool, right? When God says we're foolish, it doesn't mean we sound like fools. You need to be able to articulate the gospel and the truth of it. But he says, I didn't come again with a real slick presentation. I knew nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. If you are a Christian, you know that message. You know that Jesus died on the cross. You know that he rose again. You know why he died on the cross, because we are sinners and we needed someone else to take our punishment. And Jesus took our, our punishment and we get his righteousness and we are declared righteous because of that. We know that. That's our message. You can do this. Everybody in this room can do this. Children can do this. Everybody can. We don't have to have all the answers. Just preach the gospel. Paul took every conversation to the cross. That's what he means when he says, I knew nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. Every conversation. Again, the funnel. No matter, they want to talk any, anything that comes into the conversation. Paul took it right down to here. Okay, but let's talk about Jesus. Yeah, but Paul, what about this? What about all the evil? Yeah, that's, that's bad. Let's talk about Jesus. Well, well, but we have all these other gods. Yeah, yeah, you have all these other gods, but let me tell you the God you don't know. Let's talk about Jesus. Everything funnels down to the cross of Jesus Christ. You can do this. This is not rocket science. This is not hard. This is a simple message that children can understand. That's the message you're trying to get across to unbelievers. It's all about Jesus and him crucified. Paul says, that's all I did. I talked about Jesus, and we should too. Let's go back to Romans 1 for a minute. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So what we're trying to do is get people to believe the gospel. That's how they get saved. Jew first and also to the Greek. That's the, the historical uh, outline. Came to the Jews first and then spread out to the rest of the world. And verse 17 tells us why this is. For the reason the gospel is the power of God for salvation is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And then he quotes the Old Testament, the just shall live by faith. By believing in the gospel, God's righteousness is revealed. This gets back to what we talked about in the very first sermon in the series. What are we trying to do? We're trying to get people to a place where they fear God. Peter said this in Acts chapter 10. We want them to fear God. We want them to understand God has the authority to judge and the power to punish. So at some point, you talk to them about the justice they deserve because they're sinners, and, and I deserve it, you deserve it, we all deserve it. Everybody does. In the gospel, God will declare them righteous. The, the Bible calls that justification. 
If they believe the gospel, if they put their faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus, God will declare them righteous. This is where you can get very personal with people. This is where you can remind them of your own sin, your own failings, how you've disappointed God, how you've broken his law. And remind them, all of us are going to stand before God at judgment. And if any of us are not declared righteous at that judgment, we're going to be sent to eternal punishment. We can be very humble about this. I need his righteousness as much as you do. I have his righteousness because I believe the gospel. You can be right with God if you'll believe the gospel. The righteousness of God is revealed there and also his righteousness in punishing sin. He punished Jesus instead of us. That's why the gospel has the power to save because it gives us righteousness and our sin is taken care of on the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the heart of it. So the goal is to get to judgment and Jesus when we're talking to unbelievers. It's that simple. So let's take a few minutes here and talk about very practically how this might work. And uh, hopefully you'll add on your own uh, examples here. But how might this work? How do we actually get into a gospel conversation with an unbeliever? So when Jim's out there aerating and somebody comes out and says, thank you very much, how does he start a conversation with them about, about Jesus? It's kind of a weird thing to do when you're out aerating somebody's yard. Or when you're talking to the guy walking the dog or you're walking your dog and they're talking to you, whatever. How do we do this? How do we do this with our neighbors? Uh, I've listened to other people. I've listened to some of your examples. I've got some of my own. I just want to throw a few out at you. Uh, I, uh, maybe you know who Matt Chandler is. Some of you know who he is. He's a pretty popular Southern Baptist uh, preacher down in Texas. And he describes uh, how it works with him. You know, as a pastor, anywhere I go, anywhere he goes, uh, inevitably when you meet somebody new, the question always comes, what do you do for a living? And I've told you this before, sometimes I don't say I'm a pastor, especially when there's somebody with scissors close to my ear, because no kidding, the last time uh, somebody was cutting my hair and I said I'm a pastor, they cut my ear. And so now I say things like, uh, I'm a marriage counselor, or a family counselor, or I'm a teacher, and eventually I get around to being a pastor, but that kind of made me a little gun shy. But it always comes up, what do you do for a living? So Matt Chandler says, whenever somebody asks him what do you do for a living, he says, well, I'm a pastor. As soon as he says that, there's an elephant in the room, right? So he says, look, we both know this is coming. We might as well get it over with right here now. So where are you with Jesus? What's your relationship like with Jesus? You might as well know I'm going to talk to you about Jesus, so let's just do it right now. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not a weirdo. I'll just tell you this is where I'm at with Jesus, where you're at with Jesus. Great. Now we can go on with our relationship hoping that now, next time he has a conversation with the guy, uh, that, that elephant is, is exposed and, and, and they can carry on a relationship and maybe you can actually talk about Jesus again. So I was thinking about that and realizing, you know, we could do the same kind of thing. Most of you are not pastors, so when somebody asks you what do you do for a living, you don't say, I'm a pastor. That would be lying. <laughs> but can you create a scenario that is similar? Yes. Somewhere in your conversation, mention something about church. Just, just fit it in somewhere. Where I go to church, oh, that's over near my church, or on Sundays I go to church, whatever. Something about church. And as soon as that's out, you can say to them, hey, you know, I already mentioned uh, church, and so just, just to acknowledge the elephant in the room, uh, I'd love to know what, you know, it's coming. Eventually, if we stay in this uh, relationship, I'm going to ask you about it anyway. So let's just do it now. What, what's your relationship to Jesus? Really? I mean, imagine that. You can actually set them up for this conversation intentionally say something about church, and then refer back to it. Oh, I told you about church. Well, let's talk about it. This is why I go to church. Do you? That kind of thing. People are generally not afraid to engage in those conversations. They're not going to be turned off by that. Uh, in fact, they're going to be more likely to engage with you if you're honest about it. If you say something about church and then act all sheepish and close the door in the conversation, then yeah, they're going to they're going to respond in kind. But if you say, hey, you know, I mentioned church, so I'd like to talk to you. What, what's your relationship like with Jesus? See what they say. They're probably not going to respond poorly. My experience is people don't, except barbers. Uh, my dad has been using this for decades. He asked the question. Where do you go to church? 
I've heard him do it with nurses. My, for those of you who don't know, my dad's elderly. He's 96. He's been in assisted living for, well, actually assisted living for only a month or so, but he's been in uh, independent living with going to the doctors all the time for several years. And uh, I, he, everybody, he, I, but I remember back when I was a kid, he always took me everywhere with him. We'd go to the hardware store. We'd go to the mechanic, whatever, wherever we went. And he would always ask, where do you go to church? And I'll be honest. As a junior high or so, with all my friends, you know, I knew a lot of people and stuff. I was like, Dad, do you have to ask that question? Because that other kid over there probably goes to my school and he's going to think I'm one of those weird church people. Yeah, I'll, I'll confess that right here. But he asked that. And in and, and hindsight, I realized that is a brilliant question. Every response opens the door for conversation. Every single response opens the door for conversation. Obviously, if they say, well, I go to this church, then, then great. If it's a good church, then, then great. Then you can just buy your groceries and get out of there. But if they say, oh, I don't really have one. I've heard people say that. Oh, I don't really have one. Guess what the follow-up is? Great, you should come to my church. Right? That's easy. Or they say, yeah, I go to this church, but I don't really go very much. Oh, why not? Why not? Well, then they're going to give you some, ah, I just don't feel like it... it helps me much. Oh, well, you should go to my church because our church will help you a lot. Or what do you expect to get out of church? What would be a help to you? Well, if it just had some relevance to my life. Oh, so would you say that Jesus isn't relevant to your life? Not in a cynical way, not in a, in a condemning way, just what kind of help do you, are you trying to get there and bring it back to Jesus, right? Uh, if they say, nah, church is full of hypocrites, Okay, here's the response to that. You ready? Because you're going to hear that one. Church is full of hypocrites. Right response? We've got room for one more. <laughs> no, don't say that. <laughs> Why? Why? Why do you say that? Why do you say the church is full of hypocrites? Oh, I went to church growing up, and all those people, they preached on Sunday and did all this, but you know, I knew how they lived their lives. Yeah, yeah, I know people like that too. It's true, and that, that's sad, and that's not what Jesus wants, but... Let me talk to you about what Jesus really wants and what, what Christians should be striving to be. You see, by asking that question, where do you go to church? It doesn't matter what they say, you now have a conversation starter that you can engage with them. On. There's, a, there's a man in our church now, he's been in uh, a church at Frack for many years now, uh, that we led to the Lord and he came because someone did this very thing. Uh, they invited him to, at the time we had Wednesday night uh, services and we had food. This was a young single guy, right? Not rocket science to see why he came to, uh, to the, the Wednesday night thing. And uh, he'd grown up in a very harsh church, uh, very, very judgmental, very uh, legalistic, uh, didn't sound like a lot of gospel was preached there, but a lot of law, a lot of con condemnation, that kind of thing. So he really wanted nothing to do with church, but he did like to eat. So he came to this, uh, this Wednesday night, and uh, the, the person who, who invited him introduced him to me, and we started talking, and as we were talking, I asked him about uh, his background and all that, and uh, he said to me, he explained what his church was like growing up, and I said, oh, that sounds awful. I wouldn't want to go to church if that was my experience either. You should come to Frack Sunday. You will see a church like you've never seen before. Put me to the test on this. I promise you. Come to church this Sunday, and if you don't have a totally different experience, then I'll leave you alone and never bother you again. He came that Sunday. He met all of you. He experienced the joy of the Lord and real community and love and grace and gospel preaching. I don't think he's missed a Sunday since. And he came and bowed his knee to the Lord, put his faith in Christ, and he's growing like crazy. This is many, many years ago. Because somebody said, we can show you something different from your experience. Don't be afraid to bring people to this church. I think we're a good representation of what the church should be. I mean, we, we have our flaws, but everybody's got their flaws, right? We're still waiting for that perfection that's coming. But bring them. Invite them. Someone last week, uh, she and I were talking after the service and talking about baptism and stuff, and she's got a coworker that she's thinking about inviting, and she did. I'm not going to call her out just now, although that's been the trend today. Uh, I'm not going to call her out just now, but uh, I praise the Lord for that. And in a week or two, this uh, coworker said she would come and join us on Sunday morning. And I'm excited because I know you all well enough to know she's going to feel welcomed. She's going to feel loved. She's going to see a community that people out there long to be part of. And she's going to hear truth 
spoken and the gospel preached, and who knows what the Lord may do with that. That's good. Do that. We can do this. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, in our culture, Christians, non-Christians, everybody wears crosses on their being. Right? They got on chains, got on earrings, got a tattoo. They got all over their bodies crosses. That's an easy conversation starter. Oh, are you a Christian? No, I just like the way it looks. Oh. I'm not going to say it the first thing that came to my mind. Easy conversation starter. Why do you think that symbol has become universal? It's everywhere. I mean, why would you pick that to put on your body if you're not a Christian? Not, again, not in a cynical way, not in a judgmental way. Actually ask them the genuine question, why? why? Why does everybody you see have crosses on? Hmm. Well, I don't know. I can tell you. And now you've got a gospel conversation going. This is the universal symbol for Christianity. That's why Christianity has dominated the West for two millennia now. Let's lead to the third one. You know this, I've heard, I say this almost every year at the end of the year, but I'm going to say it again now, not quite at the end of the year. I love to bring up New Year's Day as an evangelism conversation starter. The entire Western world, the entire Western world knows that today is August 26th, 2018. Nobody's going to argue with you about that. 2,018 years since what? It used to be A.D., right? A.D. 2018. That's two letters that symbolize the Latin word anno domini, year of our Lord Jesus. So as we get closer to New Year's, we're going to ask them, what do you do for New Year's? Or we ask them now. So I'm just curious. <laughs> I know it's a little premature, but when New Year's comes, what are you going to do for New Year's Eve? Do you like to go out and party? What do you like to do? And then what do you think New Year's, so 2019 is the next year. What are we counting from? Uh, I can answer that question for you. It's the 2019th year of the reign of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about Jesus. Might work. Or you're free to use this one. So my wacko pastor last week preached on this. What do you think about that? <laughs> Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll play that role for you. But think about it. You know, somebody asks, how's your week going? You know, I've been pondering. Uh, last week... On Sunday, a pastor preached on baptism and how important baptism is. Do you know what baptism is? Have you been baptized? Yeah, I was baptized as a kid. Or, yeah, I was baptized, but that's when I believed all that nonsense, but not anymore. Baptism, what's baptism? Oh, you don't know? Well, let, me, let me tell you what baptism is. Now you got into a gospel conversation. Really? People want to talk. Especially the younger generations, they really do want to talk. They are not afraid of these questions. Ask them. And then, I mean, these are not my favorite topics, but they certainly can help us get into some conversations. There's always a Christian scandal. I mean, right now, there's the big Catholic situation. And I, again, funnel to Jesus. Don't get into all the stuff going on there, but just acknowledge Here's this thing going on in the broader Christian world, so-called. It's appalling. And I want to distance myself from that. What do you think? Let me tell you what the gospel, what the, let me tell you what the Bible really says. Let me tell you who God really is and how we are supposed to be, uh, conduct ourselves and how abhorrent that behavior is. Or there's, you know, there's sadly, and I, I really don't mean this tritely, there's going to be another big-named pastor, probably before the end of the year, that brings reproach upon himself in the name of Jesus. I mean, it happens regularly, right? Again, we can bring that up and just say, uh, yeah, I, I, what do you think about that? Oh, it's just like all the other, every, that's just the church, that's Christians, that's, that's the pastors, they're all just a bunch of hypocrites. Yeah, I can see why you think that. It's really disappointing what happened there. 
But you know, that's not a good representation of Christ and the church and Christianity. And let me tell you what is. Let me tell you about Jesus and what he's come to do. And that guy, that pastor needs forgiveness. We all need forgiveness. You need forgiveness. I'd love to talk to you about that. All of these things can be part of the big, wide opening at the top of the funnel that lead down to the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every person in this room is capable of having any of those conversations. We just are. And it's the power of God for salvation. That's it. You want to get to the place in that discussion where you can talk about Jesus, the Son of God, dying on the cross, taking your punishment, rising again, and says, anyone who calls on my name, I'll forgive. You can do that. Every single one of you. All of us. So as we seek to fill the city, as we seek to preach the gospel and make disciples in Colorado Springs, that's where we want these conversations to go. And we don't need special ministries. We don't need special programs. We don't need special events. All those things may be helpful, but all we need is the gospel. That's the heart of it. And when I counsel, I like to boil things down, and I say, say to this counselees all the time, this is not easy, but it is really simple. I mean, think about it. Any, any struggles you've had that you need counseling for, most of the time, with rare, there are some exceptions, but most of the time, it's really simple, but it's not easy. Well, that's how this is. The gospel is pretty simple. If children can understand it, it's simple. But it's not easy. It's not easy for us. But we've got to put our hope and trust in, not ourselves, not in the technique, not in the program. Put our trust in the message of the gospel that God says he will use to save people. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I'm convinced it is that simple. Paul knew it was that simple. Peter knew it was that simple. But it is hard. We talk ourselves out of it. We back down. We become afraid, whatever. Father, fill us with your spirit and grant us boldness. Grant us courage. Grant us clarity of thought. Give us the motivation and the focus to establish these relationships. To take the risk, to, to love people enough, to love you enough to where we want to engage in these conversations. And Father, I ask again, would you pour out your favor upon us? We are striving to do your will, to preach the gospel, to reach this city. Would you pour out your spirit and your favor and your grace, the grace that we've been singing about all morning, and extend your kingdom in this city through our ministry for your glory and for the good of lost people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.